Taiwan so-called transit trip through the United States has heightened cross-street tensions. This move is seen by Beijing as a provocation to China's sovereignty. During her stay in New York, Tsai Ing-wen went to the Hudson Institute and received the Global Leadership Award. The most controversial part, though, is Tsai's meeting with U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, the successor of Nancy Pelosi, who visited Taiwan last August. Using Taiwan as a pawn, will Washington's divide-and-conquer strategy vis-a-vis -vis China ultimately reach the point of no return? Is Tsai Ing-wen helping or hurting the best interests of Taiwan? Welcome to this special edition of Tsai Ing-wen, her Washington master's voice. This is Tsai Ing-wen's seventh so-called transit through the United States as Taiwan's regional leader. Her most recent stopover was in 2019 on her way to Haiti and other Caribbean countries. A notable difference this time. Officially, Tsai would be on a tended trip to Belize and Guatemala, but in reality, she only spent four days in those countries and the remaining six days in the United States. I mean, that is a pretty long transit. Chungfan not only has Beijing condemned Tsai Ing-wen's trip as politically motivated, but many people on the island of Taiwan also believe that Tsai's move is harming Taiwan's own interests. Protests erupted on the day of her departure for America. Preserving a facade of being neutral, the White House has downplayed Tsai's stopover as routine. However, many experts on international law believe that Washington's Taiwan policy throughout the decades, including allowing Tsai to visit and to meet senior U.S. leaders, violated the letter and the spirit of the One China Agreement, something the U.S. had come into legally binding deals with Beijing when the two sides established the diplomatic relations in 1979. The United States recognizes the government of the People's Republic of China as a sole legal government of China. Within this context, the people of the United States will maintain cultural, commercial, and other unofficial relations with the people of Taiwan. The government of the United States of America acknowledges the Chinese position that there is but one China and Taiwan is part of China. Yet in an about face and double dealing, which is rife in U.S. foreign policy making, Washington passed the Taiwan Relations Act that same year, promising Taiwan military and strategic support vis-a-vis -vis Beijing. In 1994, Li Teng-hui, the secessionist-minded late leader of Taiwan region, made a stopover in Hawaii, setting what Beijing considers a dangerous precedent for Taiwan leaders use so-called unofficial private trips to pursue stopover diplomacy and in fact rallying support among the Americans for Taiwan independence. Things took a turn for the worse, much worse I would say, in March 2018 when U.S. Congress passed the Taiwan Travel Act which allows U.S. government's officials at all levels to travel to Taiwan and meet with their counterparts there and vice versa. During a visit to Taipei, Robert O'Brien, former U.S. National Security Advisor, was even awarded a medal by Tsai Ing-wen for his contributions to U.S.-Taiwan relations. Yet, as people are still figuring out what O'Brien's contributions to Taiwan really was, O'Brien went on the record and said this. I mean, the United States and its allies are never going to let those factories fall into Chinese hands, even if there was a successful invasion of Taiwan. They, they would be gone, is what you're saying. The Chinese successfully took Taiwan those facilities and production capacity would be gone. Is that what I'm hearing I, you say? I, I can't imagine they'd be intact. 
According to a poll conducted by the Democracy Foundation in Taiwan, 55% of respondents believe that the United States is using Taiwan as a strategic tool to contain China rather than caring about Taiwan's own best interests. This fear has been heightened by O'Brien's revelation of the Taiwan Destruction Plan. At the end of the day, a common denominator among Tsai and her patrons in Washington is domestic politics and personal political gains, which in many ways contradicted the best interests of Taiwan. To pull it off, Tsai Ing-wen not only seeks help from Washington, but accelerated a domestic agenda known as desinicization. The Democratic Progressive Party, or the DPP, has a track record of rallying a fraction of Taiwan society for secession and independence through education and indoctrination. Since coming to power, Tsai Ing-wen has initiated a series of policies aimed at desinicizing Taiwan. In fact, the so-called desinicization means to desinicize the core values and interests which Taiwan depends on to exist. Such a move will have a profound impact on the future development of the people in Taiwan. In order to claim the right for self-determination, Taiwan must be an independent and different from mainland China race. So DPP has tried for a long, long time to redefine what Taiwan and Taiwanese is about. The number one tactic is to dilute the importance of China, Chinese culture, Chinese language, and Chinese heritage. They no longer have a focus on mainland China, on Chinese history, and Chinese literature. That has a huge impact on the next generations, the future generations, in terms of how they see themselves, what their affinity is, and how they are predisposed to look at present-day China, being it culturally or economically. In fact, the Taiwan authorities have always been promoting desinicization in the social, cultural, historical, and educational fields. Former leaders Li Tonghui, Chen Shui Bian, and the current leader Tsai Ing wen have all intended to cut off the historical and the political link between the Chinese mainland and the Taiwan region. So, from that roots, you come to see Chen Shui Bian, and now you see Tsai Ing wen. All of them have a very strong Japanese identification and little Chinese identification. With them being at control, you not only have our textbook or the curricula being changed, you also have a lot of changes in societies. For example, today you will see an entirely in Japanese advertising on local TV, which was never seen and never heard of. You now also have a government plan to remove Chinese from all official tests. So if you want to write for high school or college, or even if you just want to write for being a civil servant, they plan not to have a Chinese language test being included in that. So you can see a very, very strong pro-Japan Taiwan independence movement. It's not just independent from mainland China, it's independent from China and affiliated with Japan. Those are the strong underpinning in Taiwan. If you don't see that, you will miss the really big telltale sign. Uh, DPP and especially uh, Tsai Ing-wen uh, did give some negative impact on the uh, tradition, on the history uh, of China in this regard. But I don't think uh, she can make it because I have been to Taiwan twice and uh, I'm quite uh, happy that uh, the local people still think they're or you know Chinese, and they would like to continue uh, the culture, the exchanges with people uh, from mainland, and uh, continue such a uh, you know tradition of uh, China. This is foundation for the one China's policy. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, 
We have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Now, the DPP's strategy is to exploit the de facto separation with the Chinese mainland due to the Chinese Civil War in the 1940s and to get rid of the Chineseness in social, cultural, and political life of people in Taiwan. The campaign has supporters from the United States. The Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, is one of the staunchest supporters for Taiwan. In return, Taiwan is one of its largest donors. According to CSIS website, Tsai Ing-wen administration has donated between 200,000 to just under half a million U.S. dollars for regional studies. The Responsible Statecraft Organization published a report describing Taiwan's funding of American think tanks as omnipresent and rarely disclosed. Five major Washington think tanks, the Brookings Institution, the Center for American Progress, the Center for a New American Security, and the CSIS and the Hudson Institute all received funding from the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office. The report says that none of their researchers disclosed the potential conflict of interests between Taiwanese funding and advocating for more security guarantees for and trade with Taiwan. Ever since the beginning of DPP, they have always showed themselves, especially in Washington, as the pro-democracy and pro-progressive value party. Therefore, it is extremely expedient for them to partner with, with especially the U.S. Democratic Party. Especially the current rhetoric, the narrative, is to find partners in democracy and partners in value. Tsai Ing-wen knows exactly what to say. However, under her control, her administration was doing exactly the opposite. In the first term of Tsai Ing-wen, she showed to Taiwan that she is a moderate and she has the ability to maintain status quo across Taiwan Straits. With her background as part of the KMT Security Council member under Li Denghui, she had a lot of buy-in in those narratives. But after her second term, her government has quickly passed legislations against their competitor, their major competitors, KB KMT, and other political parties. For instance, they passed ill-gotten party asset law to confiscate party assets, including um, any kinds of party assets from KMT and the so-called KMT affiliates. Therefore, there were a lot of collateral damages. They also passed the so-called Transformation Justice Act that allowed them to rewrite the entire history since 1949. In fact, they can rewrite the history since 1935 when Taiwan returned to the hands of Chinese government. Before that, it was under Japanese rule. The third thing they did was they also confiscated media licenses such as CTI and they confiscated the assets, the huge number of assets of a farmland association which was established in Qing Dynasty. All of this shows to the world, at least shows to people in Taiwan, that democracy in their explanation is like a facade in a studio. What Pelosi saw when she came mm -hmm. here, she saw that beautiful facade of a democratic avenue like in the studio, but people in Taiwan was experiencing the backbone the true authoritarian uh, movements made by Tsai Ing-wen's um, administration in different way, shape, and form. So I would say they are neither democratic nor progressive. It's only a facade of um, value that the United States welcomed. The United States turned a blind eye to all the sufferings and all the people being oppressed by the current DPP government. Taiwan. The U.S. knows very well that the Taiwan region not being reunited with the mainland is an invaluable asset for them. One analogy is that Taiwan is the watchdog for the U.S. who needs to bring his own food. There's nothing more pathetic than that. U.S. politicians get callings from Taiwan, too. The Taiwan Lobby report published by the Center for International Policy found 
The Taiwan's lobbyists had contacted Nancy Pelosi's office 18 times during the summer of 2019. The DPP has been lobbying Nancy Pelosi since 2018 through public relation companies. How much money have they spent? 49,377 U.S. dollars. On August the 2nd, 2022, then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi landed in China's Taiwan region and met with the leader of the island the next day. Tsai conferred Pelosi with an order of propitious clouds with special grand cordon and said that she's truly grateful to Pelosi for showcasing U.S. Congress's staunch support for Taiwan. The two sides, I mean Tsai Ing-wen and Nancy Pelosi, uh, would like to use such a uh, uh, you know, chance to get more support or get more attention uh, from the public as a so-called democratic uh, uh, system or democratic leader uh, in this region or in the United States. So I think uh, this is not a real uh, democracy for uh, the local people in Taiwan and also for the uh, Americans this time. Uh, DPP would like to manipulate the so-called democracy, freedom, human rights in Taiwan uh, for the party's sake, because uh, this is uh, only a flag uh, for uh, the party to mobilize support from the local people and also uh, get some support from Washington, D.C. So this is actually a game played by the uh, party, especially by Tsai Ing-wen. From the political maneuver perspective, Taiwan does seem to be gaining a lot in terms of notoriety as well as wide support from the so-called Western partners. However, people in Taiwan, especially those who are opposed to A, her policy or her administrative measures, have now been sacrificed. So the three perspectives are very, very different. Let's talk about um, people who were being oppressed by the DPP government. Those people have in the past hope that international community would see the true suffering of the people and have tried to wage um, all kinds of campaigns so that people can see what's really happening. With Nancy Pelosi coming to Taiwan, touting the achievement of the DPP government, it's stepping on all the hopes and dreams of the people who are still fighting those injustice measures. In addition to that, the current change of the status quo, I put in quote, because Tsai Ing-wen promised everybody that she would maintain status quo. Status quo for most people is peace and stability across Taiwan Straits. Now, anyone who is against changing of status quo in Taiwan, now is being pushed to the sideline or being mobilized and said, look, you know, mainland China has done all these military exercises against us. They are the big bad wolf. You have to come behind the government. You have to mobilize. So you see this language and narrative on all front pages. So also, those who have hoped for justice are now being sold, and those who have hoped for peace are now being mobilized and oppressed. There's been too much instability that has crept into the U.S.'s uh, one China policy over the last five years, I would submit. And Mr. Biden has not helped the cause either by tamping down what the, what the Trump administration, the misdeeds that the Trump administration did in this regard. He himself has contradicted himself in terms of where U.S. stands on one China policy. And what we have seen over the last couple of years is a relentless challenge of that one China principle of China by way of the U.S.'s one China policy. And it is this instability in the U.S.'s one China policy, despite, Mr. Pr despite President Biden's reassurances directly to President Xi, uh, that doesn't hold up, doesn't stand, it, 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 it adds to mistrust rather than trust. When Tsai Ing-wen assumed office in 2016, the regime on Taiwan was recognized by 22 countries. This number has shrunk to 13 as of early April 2023. The most recent country to switch diplomatic recognition from Taipei to Beijing was the Central American state of Honduras. One 
The One China Principle is the general consensus of the international community and the basic norms of international relations, recognized by the UN General Assembly Resolution No. 2758 of 1971. Tsai Ing-wen's Taiwan independence campaign is enriching the United States and consolidating her power base at the expense of many of the island's domestic priorities. Many residents in Taiwan are struggling to make ends meet. Rising inflation, aging infrastructure, growing inequalities are all issues facing Taiwan. We are living such a miserable life. Tsai Ing-wen, are you listening to us? The economy is in a slam. How can we expect a better life? The officials are living in the royal palace and know nothing about people's woes. That's what I want to tell Tsai. Let her think about it. As we all uh, have seen in recent uh, years, the DPP and uh, especially Tsai Ing-wen as the regional leader, uh, they would like to uh, manipulate the international uh, the situation for uh, the sake of the, the DPP party and for Tsai Ing-wen herself, uh, not uh, only uh, for the you know, people, uh, but also for the you know, the, some uh, speci uh, specific interests of group in, in the island. And uh, uh, in this regard, we all uh, have, have seen the uh, bad result of development of the economy in the land and the trade relations with other you know, countries in uh, th this region. So I think uh, for the assessment of the so-called go governance of the, of, the, of the party, I mean DPP and uh, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, I'm sure everybody uh, can say this is a really a bad party for the people, uh, for the uh, you know, relation between uh, mainland and the island. And uh, I, I think in the future, uh, I don't think uh, the DPP party or Tsai Ing-wen can make it uh, in going independence. This is uh, really a, a common sense for everybody mm -hmm. uh, in, in this region. And, but I'm sure uh, Tsai Ing-wen and uh, her party uh, will continue the mani mani manipulation of the situation uh, for the party's sake uh, in the future, not for the sake of the uh, public in Taiwan. <laughs> In response to many of the DPP policies that jeopardize Taiwan's best interests, people on the island expressed their dissatisfaction in 2022 Taiwan local elections. The KMP outperformed the DPP, reclaiming many of the pro-KMP territories that the DPP had previously gained, resulting in the DPP's worst electoral defeat in history. Following this, Tsai Ing-wen resigned as party chair. Even as Tsai Ing-wen stepping down as party leader, it remains to be seen to what extent will her party keep pushing for Taiwan independence. As Tsai's term is set to end in 2024, what kind of a politician will she be remembered for? Will she be remembered as someone who led Taiwan's secessionist movement to a point of no return? Or will she be recalled as someone who toughened Beijing's resolve to fasten the process of reunification? I think she will either be remembered as the one who broke and changed the status quo and have no ability to restore an equilibrium of peace and stability, or as someone who is a strong partner of the United States and Japan. I'm not ruling out the second possibility, even though with that second possibility, Taiwan will force, will pay a huge price in the process. In cultivating a separate Taiwanese identity unrelated to that of the Chinese, 
and according Western support for his so-called independent Taiwan, Tsai is not only distorting history for political expediency, but challenging Beijing's red line. In Taiwan, people like Tsai Ing-wen follow the U.S. lead and renounce the national interest. These perverse actions will not change the international consensus of the One China Principle or the belief that Taiwan will return to the motherland. Those who play with fire will perish by it. This is the time that DPP is receiving an extremely clear signal that if they continue to push the Taiwan independence agenda, working in connection with the United States, then there will be no international space. In 2022, Beijing's strong response to Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan came quickly after her departure, with large-scale military exercises and intensified talks of an eventual reunification. Back then, over 160 countries condemned Pelosi's trip and reiterated their commitment to the One China Principle. It remains to be seen the fallout from Tsai Ing-wen's controversial trip to the United States this time, but one thing is almost certain. Taiwan's secessionist-minded politicians won't be allowed by Beijing to go on making a scene like this, nor will they be allowed to collude with their patrons in Washington indefinitely. In the mind of many Chinese, enough is enough.